He had conquered the world. From Mount Olympus to the Himalayas. Yet they had astounded Alexander the Great. Two tombs, a roof garden, two colossal statues, a temple, and a lighthouse. To Alexander, despite his raft of victories, they were the wonders of the world. Of his world, the ancient world. Without our technology, our tools, and in some cases even without use of the wheel, they succeeded in creating such masterful, daring works of art and architecture and engineering that centuries after all but one have perished, they still stagger the imagination. The gods of the Nile, the Fertile Crescent, Olympus, had graced that sparsely populated world with natural wonders of breathtaking beauty. Behold, you unworthy mortals, the wonders of this earth. Though frail and finite, the mortals answered with wonders of their own. These are ours. The work of our brains and our blistered hands. Our daring. Our, our creative, creative fires. fires. Two thousand years ago, Philo of Byzantium compiled this list of marvels of the ancient world. There are seven entries, but why were those wonders fixed at seven? To the ancients, Seven was a sacred number. To them, there were seven planets in our solar system. There are 400 references to seven in the Bible. A Jewish ritual candle holder, a menorah, has seven branches. In the Kabbalah and in the Muslim systems, God and his angels dwell in the farthest of the spheres, the seventh heaven. And the world held seven wonders, seven thrusts into the divine by the ancients, which became so mired in legend and frilled with fancy that until the last century, we weren't certain that all seven had actually existed. We know now that in fact, all had stood. Egypt's great pyramid, Babylon's legendary hanging gardens, the statue of Zeus at Olympus. In Ephesus, the temple of Artemis. At Halicarnassus, the tomb of Mausolos, the fabled Colossus of Rhodes. And at Alexandria, the world's most famous lighthouse. Discovering them anew is an odyssey that the great Alexander himself might have embarked upon. Of looking into the ravages of natural disasters and of man's vandalism. of seeking in alluvial mud and the rubble of ruins the glories that at once towered overhead. And the treasure of stories that surrounds them to envision them with the eye of knowledge for all but one have been destroyed. That one the wonder which has stood through 50 centuries of killing sun and storms of the Sahara, before which Alexander stood in awe. The Great Pyramid of Egypt. In seeking this first wonder, one must venture to the southern rim of the Mediterranean world, to the Pharaonic Kingdom of Egypt, and brave a danger more terrifying than any which confronted Ulysses on his perilous odyssey. Cairo traffic and Cairo energy charging from this urban gateway to Egypt. Its myriad minarets bristling in the shadows of skyscrapers. A colossal market town where Africa, Asia and Europe meet talking, mingling, bargaining, jostling, hustling, and hawking. The river that runs through this city is its heart, its lungs, its lease on life, the Nile, from whose overflow sprang civilization as we know it. The deepest, most ancient cultural mud from which we grew, the Egypt of the Pharaohs. 
The seeker braves the desert, the torrid sun, the blasts of wind-whipped sand, and suddenly, on the horizon, they appear as distant mountain peaks. With swelling emotion, the seeker draws closer and then stands overpowered, almost stupefied. The only remaining wonder of the ancient world stands in awe as the ancient Greek Herodotus stood in awe some 2,500 years ago, as Julius Caesar stood here in awe, as Napoleon stood in awe. These pyramids have been called the mountains of Pharaoh and the granaries of Joseph. Stargazers have called them the world's oldest astronomical observatories, tombs that tell time, huge sundials. What they are, are man's most enduring monuments to our longing for immortality. The four sides of the Great Pyramid of Cheops face exactly the four points of the compass. Built of two and a third million limestone blocks weighing up to two and a half tons apiece, its base covers 13 acres and it rises to the height of a 42-story skyscraper. It took 100,000 workmen 30 years to finish the job. It took 10 years just to build the ramp up which the stones were moved into position. Laborers worked on the pyramids just three months of each year when the Nile's flooding brought farming to a standstill. Tools, the everyday tools of construction workers in Pharaonic Egypt. Though 4,000 years old, they're still usable. In the slopes of Mogatum, one can see where the stones were quarried and then transported on sledges. Some of these sledges have been preserved, even the ropes they were pulled with. These sledges were sufficiently sturdy to haul a monument. This drawing is based on old Egyptian descriptions of how the stone blocks were raised. Contemplating these three greatest of the pyramids, Cheops, Kephron, and Mycerinus, Napoleon calculated, there are stones in these three pyramids sufficient to build a wall around all of France. Careful scrutiny of the Great Pyramid reveals that there were no less than three changes of construction plans during its building. Whatever the changes, it has stood for 50 centuries, thrusting in its finitude toward a creature comfort eternity for the Pharaoh Cheops. To ancient Egyptians, life's fulfillment was the journey into death. To enjoy an afterlife, two conditions, rigid and unchanging, need be met. The body must be intact, intact, hence mummification. Secondly, the spiritual double of the deceased, called Ka, must be provided. In the sarcophagus, with the accoutrements of the living, food, furniture, stately objects. Cheops was hungry for immortality. The embalming process for a pharaoh such as he took 70 days. He was prepared for his voyage into the afterlife. An entrance has been cut into the north face through an opening made by a greedy caliph in search of treasures inside. The air is stale. The gloomy corridors are so steep that visitors must nearly double over as they crouch their way upwards to the burial chamber. And there's always the danger of being locked in. It has happened. At last, the pharaoh's final resting place, a stone sarcophagus set into the floor of a chamber built of pink Aswan granite. The tomb is empty, the chamber stripped, Almost as imposing as Cheops is the pyramid of the pharaoh Kephron. At one time, these pyramids were completely faced with polished limestone that sparkled like glass. Some of this limestone casing still glistens at the top of Kephron's. For centuries now, local guides and hawkers have been hounding visitors with information and artifacts. They're inescapable. In the 1880s, one pesty guide pursued Mark Twain so persistently that Twain offered him $100 if he'd jump off the pyramid head first. Facing the east of the new day's sun, this stupendous hybrid, its body that of a noble lion, its face that of a royal human, the Sphinx, 
Romans dubbed it the God of Death, Arabs, a father of fear. If its purpose was to frighten away thieves from the treasure-laden tombs, it was a purpose as lost as its nose. Though the pyramids were the best guarded tombs of all time, robbers with greater regard for the blessings of here and now than for those of the afterlife did succeed in breaking the seals and stripping the sepulchers of their riches, mummies and all. Tomb robbing went on for centuries, down to our own era, and some of the most blatant robbers were those who rifled the tombs for museums in Europe and America. In 1922, Howard Carter, an Englishman, and his patron, Lord Carnarvon, broke through a sealed door to discover untouched, never before violated, the tomb of Tutankhamun. With all its treasure intact, perhaps the most splendid archaeological discovery of all time, some are convinced that a curse hung over that tomb. Within seven years, a dozen people connected with the find died strange deaths. Only five months after the discovery, Lord Carnarvon was scratching a mosquito bite on his left cheek. Blood poisoning set in. Shortly thereafter, he died of infection in a Cairo hotel nearly two hours past midnight. Unaccountably, all the city lights went out. Doctors who examined Tutankhamun's mummy discovered a scab-like mark on the left cheek. On the spot corresponding to where Lord Carnarvon had been fatally bitten by the mosquito. In gazing at the water-trapping devices in the blazing brick kilns of Iraq, we try to envision those legendary gardens as Alexander had seen them. In verdant bloom. Ancients believed that the biblical Eden, Paradise, was located somewhere in Asia Minor's Fertile Crescent, the land between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, which the Greeks called Mesopotamia. To us, it's Iraq. It's here that seekers can find remains of the second wonder of the ancient world, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. Babylon itself was so stupendous a city, it could rightly have been chosen one of the wonders of the ancient world. O oh, opulent city standing beside the waters, exclaimed the prophet Jeremiah. In the millennium before Christ, it spread over 2,500 acres of a large plain, the river Euphrates winding through its downtown, prestigious and pleasure-loving, a city-state of millions, the largest in the world. Babylon hath been a golden cup that made all the earth drunken. To partake fully of its splendor, one need parade down the processional way of Marduk and enter through this most magnificent of the city's eight gates, dedicated to Ishtar, goddess of carnal love, as Nebuchadnezzar did, and King Darius, and Alexander the Great, to clashing cymbals and fanfares of trumpets. There was an ancient argument that this processional way should have been named second wonder of the world. For all its splendor, Babylon was a brick town. Iraqi brickmakers still turn out bricks as the ancients made them here almost 30 centuries ago. Bricks of clay and water, kneaded by hand. They're dried in long rows in the sun. Most of Babylon was built of such bricks, which, of course, have long since disintegrated into dust. But those structures built of bricks fired in kilns have endured down to our day. Mighty Babylon was built of bricks, billions of bricks, enough bricks to connect the earth to the moon or to wrap the globe with them 15 times at its widest point. Here, civilization reaches back over 4,000 years. Sickles and knives, hoes and axes, fish hooks that seem as modern as today's. 
Letters written on clay tablets inserted in clay envelopes and franked with clay postage stamps. Here, kings and nobles wallowed in a worship of fleshpot gods, of whom their epic of creation sang, The gods grow drunk with drinking, their bodies are joyful, they shout aloud, their hearts exult. Babylon's far-reaching fame permeated the ancient world like a heady perfume, her wanton luxury the envy of harsh and plainer peoples. The golden helmets of her swains, the golden bangles that grace the sweetly oiled limbs of her courtesans. It was in the throne room in the magnificent southern palace that Belshazzar's feast was held, a feast described by Daniel in the Bible as a riotous profane banquet suddenly halted by the finger of God. And it was in Babylon that three young Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were cast into the flames of a fiery furnace for being faithful to the God of Israel. Because of their faith, they were untouched by the raging fire. It is the land of King Sargon, who in biblical times deported the Israelites to Assyria. The land that saw the death of Alexander the Great. It is a land of ziggurats, temple towers of the ancients in the form of a terraced pyramid, the tie between heaven and earth, an architectural scheme used by the Muslims of Iraq for their minarets. This is the site of the Tower of Babel, which was the ziggurat of Babylon. In this urban marvel, constructed almost entirely of bricks, one stunning creation was built on a stone foundation, on the summit of the citadel. The Hanging Gardens, a structure of tiers rising one above the other to the height of the city's battlements. The garden's walls, which held the amassed planting soil's great weight, were 22 feet thick. They ascended skyward in rising terraces. Lofty trees 50 feet high and 12 feet in circumference gave cool shade from the desert sun. Devices raised water from the river in great amounts for soaking the soil and refreshing the groves with moisture. Leafy crowns of the topmost trees caressed the vaulted blue of the sky. A distant spectator of these groves would suppose them to be growing on mountains. Some historians attribute this remarkable construction to Nebuchadnezzar because his wife, who came from Media, longed for the scenery of her homeland. Another tradition insists that they were the pleasure gardens of the legendary Semiramis, a queen of Assyria. In our age, the very existence of the gardens was in doubt until the discovery by German archaeologist Robert Caldevey of the vaulted building and pumps by which water was scooped out of the Euphrates River. Water was the lifeline. Developers of the ancient world forced these pleasure gardens to bloom in the Mesopotamian desert, the way today's developers use Hoover Dam to foster the blooming of the Las Vegas pleasure palaces on the wastes of Nevada. Water is still scooped from the Euphrates, but what remains of the second wonder of the world? Fragments of stone and brick, the great trees and luxuriant green are a parching, choking dust. What the desert cannot sustain in nature, it destroys. Indeed, today Babylon is a dust in the hot, stinging winds of Iraq. And if one listens, one can hear in its moaning the words of the Hebrew prophet Jeremiah. Babylon shall become ruins a haunt of wolves. Her city shall become waste places, a land dried up and desert. Enthroned in his temple at Olympia, Zeus, king of the gods, glares down at us puny mortals. His voice is thunder, his eyes the fires of heaven. The Hellenic world 
A quest for the third of the ancient wonders draws the seeker to an old, old land crested by the shadowy mountains of Homer, still wild, and hedged by a welter of islands in their blue and violet seas, Greece. The seeker's Grecian gateway, Athens. For more than a thousand years, the resounding heartbeat of Western culture, lying in a valley between two peaks, Mount Lecavitos, topped by the gleaming white chapel of St. George, and a rocky citadel called the Acropolis, the white marble temple of Athena, the Parthenon, even in ruins of unparalleled beauty and form. Only a stone's throw from here, Paul the Apostle preached the new religion of an unknown god. The modern capital is partly on and partly off the site of ancient Athens. Yet tramping over these hills, one breathes the air that sustained Pericles and Sophocles. Noisy, strenuous, energetic, that's the Athens of today. In these respects, it resembles ancient Athens, whose citizens were a scrappy lot, whether haggling over a bargain or arguing a subtle point of philosophy. But one point upon which those ancient Greeks agreed, the sacredness of Olympia. Here stood the shrine of Zeus, king of the pagan gods. And it was here, with a long tradition of athletic contests, particularly chariot racing, that the Olympic Games began. King Onimaeus, who reigned near Olympia in the dim, distant past, had a daughter, and his daughter had many suitors. Warned in a prophecy that he would be killed by his future son-in-law, the king announced that he would give his daughter to the suitor who could beat him in a chariot race. If the suitor lost, death. Well, one suitor after another lost the race and was put to death. Then young Pelops took up the challenge. In their race, the king himself was killed when he crashed his chariot. Pelops claimed the lovely daughter and the throne. Some reason that it was those chariot races that certified Olympia as the capital of athletic competitions. Others contend that it was that heroic survivor of perilous labors, Heracles, who got the athletic games going here in honor of his father, Zeus. 175 miles north of Olympia, on the confines of Thessaly, rises Mount Olympus, soaring to a height of almost 10,000 feet. To the ancient Greeks, it was the highest mountain in the world, its peak charged with religious awe. This was the home of the gods. And the unquestioned king over this court of divinities was Zeus. Zeus was sovereign, hurler of thunderbolts. His laughter could cause the earth to tremble. With all due respect, he was the old man, of godly nature, yet creaking with human weaknesses, a meddler in mortal affairs, a woman chaser who'd never take no for an answer, even if it meant transforming himself into a swan or a bull, and a maker of alibis to his long-suffering wife, the goddess Hera, who fell into jealous rages. Since Olympia was more accessible to mortals than the divine heights of Olympus, it became Zeus's second home and the center of his worship for over a thousand years. Olympia was a shrine, not a town. Most of its buildings have been built to accommodate pilgrims. Its focal point was a temple, a grand Doric structure, the Holy of Holies of the cult image of Zeus. Tall as a three-story house, this was the third wonder of the ancient world. On his head lies a wreath of olive sprays. In his right hand, he holds a figure of victory. In his left, a scepter upon which an eagle is perched. His flesh is of ivory, and his robe and sandals are of gold. His throne is studded with precious jewels. All the aspects of Zeus were found in this image. Protector of cities. God of friendship and comradeship. Protector of suppliants. God of hospitality. Giver of increase. This jug was uncovered near the temple. It's inscribed, I belong to Phidias. Indeed, it was the master sculptor Phidias who in the fifth century BC created this great image. It's told that when Phidias finished the work, he asked Zeus if it was to his liking. Immediately, a thunderbolt crashed to the temple floor. Meaning, yes. 
His head almost touched the ceiling. If Zeus were to have stood up, he would have gone through the roof. Ancient Greeks were diverse, argumentative. Athenians, Spartans, always scrapping with each other. It was their devotion to Zeus and to the games held at Olympia that welded them together as one people. To them, Olympia was a composite of St. Peter's, the Rose Bowl, Wimbledon, and Mecca. Wars were halted for the games. Greeks from over the civilized world traveled to Olympia to take part. They numbered the years from the beginning of those games, calculated to be, in our numbering, 776 BC. Zeus is dead. His great image, a wonder of the world, was destroyed in a fire in Constantinople, where it had moved some 850 years after its creation. But the games that were that testy old god's pleasure live on in the Olympic Games of today, preserving the ancient Greek ideal of developing human beings to their highest level in harmony of mind and body. Historians of ancient Greece and Rome who determined which of the man-made marvels were chosen as the seven wonders of the world knew nothing of the Great Wall of ancient Xiong Kuo, which we call China, or the cave paintings at Ajanta in Bharat, now known as India, or they might have increased the number to accommodate wonders of the ancient Orient. The seven wonders were of the world as known to the insatiably curious Greeks, places such as Persia, now known as Iran, whose invading armada of a thousand warships was destroyed by the Greek fleet. Zeus of Olympia, and the remaining four wonders were all outcroppings of the Hellenic world. Babylon of the Hanging Gardens and the Egypt which saw the building of the pyramids were to the ancient Greeks, as to us, dead civilizations, whose cultures, along with those of the Medes and Persians, were barbarous, or so thought the Greeks. Why this smugness, this haughtiness on the part of these noisy people? Because Greeks were free, free to make their laws, to run their own affairs. To them, the state existed for its citizens. In all other cultures that they knew of, the citizen existed for the state. He was the toy of tyrants. The democratizing influence of the city-states of the Greek mainland and her Aegean Isles flowed to the Asian coast. And here sprang cities, Greek cities. The seeker may glimpse these urban ruins in the quest for the fourth wonder of the ancient world. Ancient Miletus, where the scientist Thales lived, and his pupil Anaximander, first to draw a map of the world, Miletus was a magnet. An oracle here milked secrets from the future and dribbled them into the ears of eager petitioners. Even Croesus, richest king of the ancient world, came begging to this oracle. Smyrna, a name that grocers associate with a variety of fig. Smyrna, one of the oldest cities in Asia Minor, lies in modern Turkey and is now called Ishmir. Priene dates from the 4th century BC and was the beneficiary of city planning before being built, a rare thing in the ancient world. For the Greeks, a town was more than public buildings and private dwellings. It was a polis, meaning a community of citizens. Citizens who voted, who worshipped. Greatest Artemis of the Ephesians. For centuries they thronged here, multitudes from over the Greco-Roman world. At last our eyes rest upon her temple, the nurturing Artemis of Ephesus. In time, the seeker questing for the fourth wonder will arrive at the small Turkish town of Seljuk, and a landscape of which Homer wrote. 
Swans with long necks are flying left and right, boasting with white wings. 3,000 years ago, the splendid city of Ephesus stood here, prosperous and powerful. This was the sacred earth of the goddess Artemis, the Diana of the Ephesians, and the site of her great temple. There was nothing here, just a vast denuded plain, when in 1863, British archaeologist John T. Wood began digging for evidence of the temple. After a year's work, he uncovered the Upper Agura, one of the main squares of the town. It went back to the second century BC, but Ephesus was a thousand years older. He uncovered the evidence of streets, which 2,000 years ago were lined by columns. Evidence of a marble way, a clue to the wealth and grandeur of Ephesus, which grew to become a prime metropolis of the Roman Empire. Of a lower Agura, where the city's most talked about citizen, Heraclitus, sprang his philosophy on the world. After having dug for three years, Wood began excavating the city's ancient theater which had been buried by time without a trace. It is you, O King, you who brings a plague upon the children of Canis. It could hold 30,000 spectators. Six months later, he uncovered writings on columns. In his eagerness, he forged ahead breathlessly, almost blindly. After spending precious time in misreading clues and wrong way digging, he was at last tremblingly approaching his goal. The great excitement I felt when making the discovery. I, I was seized by a high fever, yet I paid no attention to it. I would not stop working. On the last day of 1869, after having searched for seven years, John T. Wood discovered in the alluvial mud the remains of the great temple of Artemis of Ephesus, the fourth wonder of the ancient world. An Egyptian temple was the house of a god, but a Greek temple was the house of the soul. This vast, gleaming marble building, its columns 60 feet high, slender and beautifully fluid, resembling the folds of a woman's gown, and the volutes of the Ionic capital suggesting locks of a woman's hair. At the base of this column is the sculpture of the god Hermes. An inscription says that it was a gift to the temple by King Croesus. Of this temple, Philo of Byzantium wrote 2,000 years ago, He who has laid eyes on it once will be convinced that the world of the immortal gods has moved from heaven to earth. Artemis was complex. A moon goddess of the Amazons, her worship went back to the sacrificial rituals of primitive man. She was the great she-bear, Ursa Major, ruler of the stars. In European Greece, and later in Rome, where she was called Diana, meaning the goddess Anna, Artemis was known as the twin sister of Apollo, vigorous but virginal, a lover of the chase but chaste, a kind of divine tomboy who gave herself only to the pleasures of hunting. One day Actian, a young huntsman, came upon Artemis bathing in a fountain. He watched, stunned by her beauty. Once aware of him, the goddess was enraged. A mortal had gazed upon her nakedness. She transformed this peeping tom into a deer and set his own pack of hunting dogs on him. The hounds tore Actian to pieces. But in Asian Ephesus, housed in her sacred chamber of this temple, chaste Artemis was a goddess of fertility, a patron of birth and nurture. Her robe covered with the heads of beasts her whole torso covered with breasts, for she nurtured all living beings. This great edifice, fourth wonder of the world, was partly demolished by the Goths in AD 262. And according to some accounts, a madman finished the job by setting fire to it in 356. His motive was to immortalize his name.
It was Herostratus. It's told that for centuries after its destruction, people gathered stones from the sacred site and worshipped them. In gazing at it, a woman was stirred with the deepest feelings of love, for it was a woman's love that built this gleaming tomb for her husband. Questing farther for the fifth wonder, the seeker needs only to travel south from Seljuk, south of Samos along the beaches of the Aegean Sea, to Bodrum in western Turkey. Small, tranquil, conservative, Bodrum is fronted by a harbor, a town of tidy gardens and sun-bleached houses, cooled by sea spray. There's little here to make a traveler scramble for his camera, other than this castle. Over centuries, Europe's crusades had created orders of knights who protected pilgrims on the dangerous routes to the Holy Land. To this end, the Knights of St. John took over Bodrum and re-fortified this old stronghold, naming it after the Apostle Peter. The old shell, it had been jerry-built over a century earlier, required considerable reinforcing to make it the thick-walled bastion that they needed in their conflicts with the Ottomans. This took stone, a lot of stone. They found it in abundance at an ancient structure here, a veritable quarry of cut architectural stones, some beautifully sculpted. They looted the site. A French observer wrote at the time, Looking around for stone, the knights found steps of white marble raised in the shape of a platform. They beat them down and dragged them away. Not only did they dismantle the structure, but they defiled a tomb. Taking candles, they descended into a cave-like place and found a chamber surrounded by columns. Another room led to a tomb with its urn and gabled lid of white marble. Bodrum had been Halicarnassus. This massive castle was rebuilt and buttressed with stones looted from the mausoleum that had made Halicarnassus famous throughout the ancient world. Today, all that survives on that site is a rectangular cutting in the rock for the foundation, a staircase to the tomb chamber, and debris of broken pillars and architectural stones. It had stood for more than 1,500 years the fifth wonder of the world. It was not built from awe or fear of the gods. It was love that built this marvel, a love between a husband and wife. This was a mammoth structure for ancient times with a circumference of 440 feet. It consisted of three main parts, a lofty podium on a base made of bricks and covered with marble. Above stood a colonnaded temple, its 36 columns supporting a roof in the form of a pyramid. This was crowned by a four-horse chariot of marble. The whole monument reached a height of 140 feet. This unusual structure grew from combining architectural forms of different civilizations, including Greek and Egyptian. In the 4th century BC, Mosolos was governor of Halicarnassus, which was then a province of the Persian Empire. He was a political powerhouse and vain. I'm a handsome brute of a man and mean in a fight. Artemisia was the wife of Mosolos. She loved her husband so intensely that she gave him immortality. From Roman times to our time, any large tomb is called a Mausolus tomb, or mausoleum. Her spouse died in B.C. 353. It was her love that built this great tomb for Mausolus. Ashes of the cremated body of Mausolus were wrapped in gold embroidered cloth, placed in a gold box, and set within a sarcophagus of alabaster. It is told that his wife ground some of his ashes into a fine powder, which she mixed with perfumes and drank. Such was her love. In Bodrum today, the only architecture that's intact from the time of Mosolus is the theater. It's one of the most famous in Asia Minor. As for what's left of the embellishments of the mausoleum, the seeker must travel to the British Museum in London. This ionic capital, 
and this lion. A horse from the chariot sculpture that crowned the summit of the monument. This exquisite frieze depicting the Greeks battling the Amazons. It's believed that this is the face and figure of Masolus, and this Artemisia made faceless by time. Because of her, her husband's name lives in our language. As we drew closer, it emerged through the mist rising from the sea, god and guardian of the isle. In pursuing the sixth wonder, the seeker again might sail from Bodrum's harbor in western Turkey to the Greek island of Rhodes on the edge of the Aegean Sea. Rhodes is an island of the sun. There's a legend that once this island slept as a beautiful maiden in the darkness of the sea's depths. It was the sun god, Helios, who raised her to the surface. He found her so beautiful and wanted her so deeply that Zeus gave her to him. And to this day, the island of Rhodes rests in the embrace of the sun god. Rhodes' history is a stormy one. Throughout the centuries, its people have suffered much endured much. Today, they're deeply loyal to mainland Greece. As with so many Greek islanders, their lives are in balance with the ebb and flow of the sea. They grow up healthy on olive oil, wine, which is always taken with food, and for feasts, the flesh of the lamb. When you look about, really look about. There's a dawning. Rhodes is a fort, a medieval fortress town. Early in the 14th century, those crusader knights of the Order of St. John, dedicated to protecting pilgrims, were driven out of the Holy Land themselves by Saracens. They found refuge here, on Rhodes, and took up residence in these sturdy stone houses. They seized control of the island, and though there were only 500 of them, they flaunted their power over a population of 100,000 Greeks. Tough and totally dedicated, these knights were at war with the whole world of Islam. Once in 1444, a Turkish sultan attacked the island with a flotilla of 180 warships packed with fighting men. Almost miraculously, these bulldog knights, so grossly outnumbered, managed to sink the entire fleet and rout the army that it carried. But the Turks kept trying. Almost a hundred years after their first foray, they managed to land an army of 150,000. It took them six long months of bombarding the castle before they flushed out those Crusader knights in 1523. They must have impressed their arch enemy, Suleiman the Magnificent, for this great sultan offered them safe passage out of the island with a sense of honor, without surrendering formally. The Grand Master of the Order accepted, and the knights sailed to Malta, where the Order has remained. Ancient Rhodes was built in the form of an amphitheater. All of the buildings were laid out from a center. Temples, public buildings, and residences were spaced to create perfect symmetrical balance when viewed from the harbor. After almost two and a half millennia, not much of the ancient town is left. The Temple of Apollo is still standing, and considering what it's been through, the stadium is in good shape. Rhodes was well known for its schools of philosophy and rhetoric. 
Cicero studied here, one of Rome's greatest orators, and Julius Caesar. But this had been a city that staggered the capitals of the ancient world with its superb sculpture. Even in our day, the famous sculpture of Laocoon is familiar to most every schoolchild. The most famous sculpture of Rhodes was somewhere out there. We're not sure exactly where. We know less about it than we do about any of the other wonders. The Colossus of Rhodes, sixth wonder of the ancient world. Piecing together descriptions from a number of ancient writers, we get an idea of what it looked like. Yet there's a lot of guesswork, hence contradictions. We're not sure whether his arm was raised in holding a torch, or saluting, or just in shading his eyes. Why, man, he doth bestride the narrow world like a colossus, and we petty men walk under his huge legs and peep about. Those lines are from Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. During the Renaissance, the Colossus was often pictured astride two pedestals. Today, archaeologists say that this would have been impossible. It was a ship's beacon in the form of the sun god Helios, patron deity of Rhodes, standing guard over the city. This was the work of Charis of Lindos and took 12 years to complete. It was cast in bronze. Standing on a tall base, it rose to a height of 18 cubits. That's nearly 110 feet. His body is that of a lithe young man. One arm is raised. His face is the likeness of the sun. The Rhodes Colossus was taller than the highest obelisk and the statues of Memnon in Egypt. Erecting so huge a statue was a feat of ancient engineering. The legs were raised first, then covered with a mound of earth and sand. The hollow inside of the bronze cast statue was filled with stones to stabilize it. Piece by piece, higher parts of the body were added to those already standing, buttressed by earthwork supports. To grasp fully the impact of the Colossus on the citizenry of its day, it would be well for the seeker to take a fast, albeit long, detour to New York Harbor. There stands the Colossus of our time. She stands proudly, magnificently, her torch raised high, lighting the way for all who come to her shores. Her official name is Liberty Guarding the World and she has been the enduring first sight of America for millions upon millions. This is our Colossus by the sea, our answer to the ancients. At 152 feet, that's 42 feet taller than the Rhodes Colossus, she stands on Bedlow Island, the work of French sculptor Auguste Bartholdi, and dedicated in 1886 to commemorate the French and American revolutions. And what inspired Monsieur Bartholdi to embark on this project? The Colossus of Rhodes. In 224 BC, the island of Rhodes was ravaged by an earthquake. The Colossus cracked at the knees and toppled as massive fragments. It had stood for only a quarter of a century, yet the ancient Roman writer Pliny reported, Even lying on the ground, it was still a wonder of the world. An oracle forbade the citizens of Rhodes to raise it again. So it lay for nearly 900 years. Plundering Arabs sold it as scrap to a merchant who hauled it off to Asia, borne by 900 camels. The Colossus of Rhodes has added one much-used word to our everyday speech. Colossal. Seven. Yes, seven. Seven virtues and seven sins, and the cast of the dice. The number that impels the seeker to retrace his steps, or his course, to where the quest began. Egypt. Fertile, fertile Egypt of the Niles flooding and three crops a year farming. Not the Egypt of the pyramids, but the breadbasket Egypt that was the prized possession of Alexander the Great. The Egypt that was called the granary of Rome. It was Egypt's beacon for the world, to lost seamen, to storm-tossed ships. 
and it shone as a symbol of the city's great library and of its learning. Here, on what had been a tiny fishing village, Alexander built the most important city in the Mediterranean world and had it named after himself. It's the nation's second largest city, with a reputation for the best food in Egypt. Though charged with vitality, it's different from Cairo. It was here that Alexander was entombed, and here that Cleopatra committed suicide. It's a city haunted by its past. This was Alexander's capital, a Greek capital. And after the Greeks and Macedonians, Romans ruled. You can see the different strains in the faces here. Greek. Roman. It boasts two sheltered harbors on the east and on the west. But the coastline has eroded. And since Alexander's time, a lot of the city has disappeared beneath the waves. The most stupendous disappearing act is that of an island called Pharos that we most want to see because of the marvel that stood on it. Today, we can no longer see the island or the ruins of the ancient port that long ago had silted up. Today, we see only an enclosing spit of sand. The area is ever, ever changing. Sand is swept in with the rising tides. Over centuries, nature buries what it builds and the sea claims all. This old map shows the city limits to be more extensive than today's. Much of the seaside real estate here is eroded. This view is exactly the same as charted on that old map. The island of Pharos should be in front of us. Instead, our eyes rest on the fortified naval base built by Sultan Keat Bey. The island of Pharos was a sturdy limestone outcrop in a sludge of sand and mud washed in by the Nile. In the reign of Ptolemy I, Alexander the Great's boyhood friend, construction of a lighthouse began on Pharos. Sostratus, they say, was the architect. It became the seventh wonder of the world. Built in three tiers of marble, it reached a height of 460 feet, the tallest building of ancient times. Though the structure was dedicated to Zeus, its purpose was to make light for ships. It functioned as a lighthouse until A.D. 641, some 900 years. Fuel was hauled up to a dome shelter where huge fires were kept burning day and night. The blaze of light they engendered was reflected out to sea by highly polished mirrors of burnished bronze from the lantern story. Light from the tower was a beacon to ships as far as 35 miles away. This was indeed a wonder. Unlike the others, its purpose was not to glorify the gods or to buttress a flimsy notion of immortality with masonry. This wonder was a welcoming beacon to ordinary men, sailors and their skippers, the shipwrecked and those lost at sea. To them, this lighthouse was simply Pharos after the island. Pharos, thou she be. Pharos, to guide them. Perhaps the great lighthouse rose from the very spot where now the Sultan's fort squats so threateningly. But the fort is built of limestone blocks, and the lighthouse, say the records, was built of marble. Marble would be the only sound evidence that it was here. A 460-foot lighthouse would have to have been built of a reflective stone like marble to cast its light 35 miles out to sea. It's told that in the 14th century, the lighthouse toppled after several earthquakes. In the walls of the fortress, we discover marble as windowsills, as decoration in the masonry. The marble components appear to be afterthoughts, not part of the original plan. Looking about carefully, we discover more marble on the floor on the treads of the staircase. We even spot marble bits in the mosaics. It's evident that the great lighthouse, the Pharos, is not all being ground to a marble sand by the ebb and flow of the tides. 
but peaks in polished brilliance from the rough, dull stones of the Sultan's fort. In many modern languages, the word faros means lighthouse. In French, they say far. In Spanish, faro. Italian and English poets versify faros. And, not surprisingly, lighthouse is faros in Greek. Faros. It whispers of the seventh wonder of the world. In reflecting on these wonders, a question arises. Did the people who lived out their workaday lives in the shadows of these wonders glow in their luster? Was a water hauler at the hanging gardens tingling with pride at his watering a wonder of the world? Or was it just a job, endlessly repeated? What of guides at the pyramids? Do they think of themselves as spokesmen for a wonder of the world? Perhaps overfamiliarity makes even the world's marvels mundane. Did sailing past the Colossus of Rhodes raise the same kind of goose flesh that the Statue of Liberty raises on a returning voyager of today? Yet, seeking knowledge of those wonders helps us to understand ourselves a bit better. The ancient past has spoken to us, and we've listened. It helps us to grasp the fact that the buildings and structures that we know, the great monuments so familiar to us, will one day be changed beyond our power to recognize them. Our Earth is beautiful. It abounds in wonders, 700 times the seven that we've sought. Nature's wonders. And wonders created by human beings. Always seeking. Always reaching to an unknown beyond. From these wonders, the seeker will gain a new vision of the world.